Yeah, sheep deep learning. Uh, I, I I think uh, that 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 comes out of the historical uh, uh, approach to learning because we have been we have been historically designing a societies in the Western world uh, uh, where you go to a university, you go to school, you go to university, and that's where you learn something. And university is university. They 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 have a certain approach and they have developed a certain method uh, on how to learn. But it, but it doesn't, uh, and that's in the way of basically uh, doing the transformation on learning, g- going away from that, uh, and also being able to uh, uh, trust uh, that people who has a need for learning will figure out how to get that learning, and maybe let them decide what others could uh, kind of tap into. It was so super interesting to be talking to life. He's on a mission to transform workplace learning. You will hear his story, his own story of learning when he was a young man, how that all turned out. And it's only natural then, because of his own journey, that he's ended up transforming the way we all learn in the workplace. A super interesting story, a super interesting project. Really enjoy listening to life. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Leif. How are you today? I'm great. Weather is uh, brilliant in Denmark. I am superb. I'm really looking forward to our conversation about learning. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming. And I will just tell our audience that There are two ways we can pronounce your first name, and the English would say Leif, and in Denmark they would say life. Life, which yeah. is also great because life is also an English word. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So, so it doesn't really matter. I think life is also a cool name. Um, so, yes. thanks for coming, and I- I'm really pleased because you're my first Danish guest, and wow. so I'm really excited about it. And I have a passion about learning. I'm a lifelong learner as well. So I, I look forward to getting into that discussion, into the detail of what you now do. But before we do that, I ask all my guests the same question, and that is for you to share a little bit about your personal life to begin with. So where were you born? Maybe a bit about your education, of course. And then where you now live? Have you moved around either in Denmark or in the world? Um, if you want to share a bit about your family, but you don't have to, your hobbies and interests, it's always interesting for people to get a sense of who you are and, and a bit of personal information. So over to you, Life. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a great question to have. It always makes me reflect about myself, and it's a bit, bit difficult to start out. But, but let me where start out where I normally start out. Mm-hmm. I am, uh, I'm, I'm basically educated as a tailor which means that I spent uh, two and a half year in a factory uh, learning how to sew. Uh, and I was basically doing uniforms. It was a fa- regular uh, factory setting. And I was kind of put there because um, I have, um, uh, I, I went to kind of a ground school. I was not very good at the, uh, at the normal school. So I went to kind of a practical school. And and there there was a lot of girls on that line, and I just I was just crazy about girls when I was 17, 18 <laughs> years old. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and they were really kind of that line, so that that's why I went to but but uh, to, to become a tailor. But what it also gave me, which I draw upon today, is the fact that that learning is practical and and kind of the factory and retail setting is the highest level to me uh, related to learning. So I, I, I draw a lot upon uh, those two years sitting in a factory learning something and, and other stuffs related to that. So that's basically where I come out of. I come out of a practical background, but I also come out of something else, which is also a personal thing. I um, uh, I wasn't very good in, in primary school. I was uh, I'm, I suffer from dyslexia. And uh, my kids are suffering from dyslexia, uh, and um, my wife is also. Uh, and and but we as a family is also have become very academic. My wife is doing a PhD. Uh, I'm handing in my masters. It's it's a normal regular thing in this house to read, uh, but it also influences a lot upon upon the way that we think about learning and and how it occupies us because we have had we've been forced throughout our entire lives 
to learn in different ways and, and come up with alternative ways of understanding and, and displaying and, and l- grasping into academic work. So, so I think that also have shaped me quite a lot. Um, and then as an eighty, so so today I'm 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 turning fifty now. I um, I have a wonderful wife. We've been together for nearly thirty something years. We've been together since we were really young. Wow. Uh, we have uh, two kids, uh, seventeen and twenty-one. Uh, gone through high school, both of them, and. Um, yeah, so so that's where I am. Live in the in near Roskilde. Some people might know of Roskilde because we have a Viking museum and a, and a big dome. In, wow. Yeah, and I lived close to the sea, and um, and in, in terms of my my uh, what I am occupied with, it's basically my work. I work. I keep thinking work when I get up in the morning. I think about work when I get home late at night. I spend. Every 10, 10 hours per day on my work, and I um, I work six days a week, uh, and and it's it's my it's my hobby is basically also yes. my work. So so uh, so let's go back to just a little bit about the education bit. So you went to what you said is like a practical kind of education, and then you ended up in a in a in a factory sewing factory. Uh-huh. Um, on the sewing line mm-hmm. and and did, did you then do a course in textiles or sewing when you were in education at the time no i, I did it, it's a it's a it's an education that takes two and a half years and then you have you have a, a before that one year school and then after that i went to the national theater of denmark but i was only there for i i think a couple of months i got kicked out basically <laughs> because because i was not i was not complying to the way that you're supposed to comply when you have such a prominent uh, um like uh, it was a it was there was a lot of people applying for this one and i got it i i really don't know why but i wasn't kind of complying to the to the regular way you're supposed to act in such a position um so i got kicked out and that was kind of my turning point because i wasn't really occupied with the with the with the actual line of uh, of field uh, of expertise i wasn't occupied with clothing it wasn't my thing i was just kind of put there for uh, by coincidence so that that after that I it t- I took a couple of years traveling, uh, and one of those were with my my wife. So, so so the, the actually education was not a uh, was not the thing for me, uh, but I was I was um, I was kind of doing it because I knew it was important to get an education. I had the feeling that that was important, and I didn't as a as a kind of my my background. I'm, I'm I was grown up in a in a in a. Um, in a boarding school environment, and I, um, I had to, I had the notion that uh, I had to do something for myself, and that education was, was kind of necessary for me to uh, finish off, even though I knew I wasn't going to use it for much. So okay, so I'm still not a hundred percent clear how you then managed to go from education and do the the tailoring bit, the the sewing line. Mm-hmm. But that was that was part of the education was that you went to a school and then you had to go for two and a half year in a practical setting before you could finish your education. Right, there. got you. So, okay, so it was like work experience. Yeah, you had to go there and then you went back to school for a couple of months. You went back to the factory setting, you went back to school, and then you did your final exams at the school, uh, kind of combining things uh, is uh, things you needed to be able to do as sewing a, a a regular jacket do regular things and and then you had to combine that with your experience from the factory so but the environment was two and a half year in a factory and one year at school and then you was educated that was the that was the process yeah and, and uh, did you actually enjoy that two and a half years in the factory what? no f- not at all no <laughs> <laughs> not at all like not really not at all but I, th- there is one experience i always share when i do speeches is is i i it was my first real experience with what what organizational and personal change is all about because i was very young and i had a cut at temper at that time as well so and i was as you are when you're 18 years old mm. very emotional and mm. and and so on but but I, and every wednesday morning they had this stupid radio program running where someone called in and you had this chit chat 
uh, with the radio host and, mm. and, and the person calling in. And, and one Wednesday morning, I got really, really brave and I got off from my sewing machine. I went all the way down through the sewing factory setting, passing the 200 ladies sitting there uh, and, and went up to the radio program. And I sh- at that time, you, you did not, you'd had the radio program out in the hall, like out of the big plant yes. uh, setting, very, very noisy. Yes. And I, I turned the radio program to a radio program called Voice, which were my kind of uh, if I could choose a radio program at that time, that would that would be voice. And I did that this Wednesday morning and the whole factory, just when I turned around, one sewing machine stopped and within, I don't know, half a minute, the whole factory were silenced. And I don't think that factory has ever been silenced before. <laughs> I, I turned that radio program to voice. And you know what? That, that was like, and one of the ladies in the middle of the factory, she got off from her sewing machine and she went all the way up to me and she literally pushed me away from the radio, pushed the button and back came, you call and we play. And and I, and that was my kind of, I, I often return to that experience to remind myself that when you want to change something in a practical setting, you need to be very respectful towards the details mm. and that was like that that was my first experience with change it's all about people small small things that mean something to people even radio programs on wednesday mornings yeah that's uh, i mean and I, I can empathize with you because um you may not know this about me but i spent 28 years in the textile industry wow. and um although i didn't do any sewing on the shop floor I, I was in the fabric industry and also the garment industry. But uh-huh. I remember, obviously, when I was in the garment industry, walking down the factory line, and it's a very, very noisy experience yeah. with all the sewing machines going. And, yeah, there is always a radio playing very loudly to entertain people because they're doing a boring, repetitive yes. job. So yes. it's it's kind of their way of escaping from the the, drud- yes. the drudgery of having to do sewing. Exactly. And um, so I can well imagine they would have been terribly upset for you yes. switching the channel. Yes, yes it was Oh, my God. Terri- you could have had a strike on. <laughs> I, I, I could. I, I just, that was an amazing, and I felt so brave. <laughs> yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> and, and 10 seconds later, I felt so stupid. I know. <laughs> oh, I great. love that story. Yeah, it's great. Okay, it so... Is. So you went traveling the world as well? Yes, yes, I did. How long did you do that for? I did it first for one year as uh, I have been 21 years old, maybe 20, 20, I think, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And I went traveling the world in Asia. That was like the normal thing you did if you had a little bit of fire in your back and and couldn't settle down. You went traveling for a year and I just made a lot of money and and went traveling, Uh, had a great time uh, met some great friends in nepal and tibet and that was really really nice and then i came back met my wife and we went traveling again for a year wow yeah also same similar similar uh, trip around the world and then as we came home we kind of settled down a little bit and she she was already doing her uh, her last uh, degree, uh, uh, having a master in psychology and communication at that time, yes. and uh, and we had a um, we had our first kid coming, and I was twenty six, and that was basically also where I started my academic education. Um, I was twenty six. I had a what will be a regular high school thing. I did that as a twenty six year old um, because I was out of the practical environment, and I didn't. I didn't see myself as an academic at mm. that point. Mm. So it's really interesting that you mentioned the age of 26 because you must know that the frontal lobe of our brain, which is also mm. called the executive, which is yes. the area of decision, decision making, yes, you know, for, being for able tech, to rationalize, um, doesn't fully get developed until we're 25. Yeah, I know. So that is when we wake up. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've been in yeah. this fog, you know, for like from yeah. 18 through to 25 for like seven yeah. years. And then we kind of go, right, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, yeah, I fully, and I see that on my kids as well. 
So yeah, I'm, I bet. Yeah. And and I try. I keep reminding myself that that we shouldn't be too concerned. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, I've got exactly the same here too. Right. <laughs> With, yeah. So oh, that's brilliant. So what? Okay. So tell me then. You went to become a bit more academic. Yeah. And you went back to school. And so did you get a job at the same time or how did that work? Yeah, I, I've always had a job. I've always been, uh, I think I at that point, I have had my own company, maybe one or two companies at that point. Wow. Uh, uh, I always had things on the side that I did. I, I've been very entrepreneurial since I was very, very young. And the first kind of company I did was a, we called it a um uh, the night shift and the night shifts were basically people calling us. That was at the era of the first mobile phones. You remember the big ones that were kind of feeling like a brick in your hand. Yes. Uh, those, that was the time of the size of those phones. And, uh, and, and you called and we came bicycling out and we drove you home in your own car. So you could have your own car at your house uh, uh, on a Sunday morning, even though you had been drinking on Saturday. Um, that was that was called an ice shift. That was my first real experience with uh, with business. And then my second one was uh, my wife and I had uh, imported clothing from. Maybe that was the first one. I don't really remember. But we were in <laughs> we were importing clothes from Nepal uh, yes. uh, and sold. Uh, we're selling it on um, on uh, festivals around Denmark. Uh, and that, that's also a great story. The first year we, we got a lot of clothes home. We sold it all. It was bad weather and we had warm woolen clothes from Nepal. And the year later we scaled it up three times and we had a summer where it was uh, 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, there were absolutely no one buying wooden clothing from Nepal. So <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of the end of that story. Yes. Uh, uh, so, so, yeah. So, so entrepreneurial at a very young age and mm -hmm. starting your own businesses. And so it's interesting, isn't it? Because you kind of rebelled against learning. So mm -hmm. you obviously were more of a practical guy, actually yep. doing something practically rather than sitting in a classroom and learning um, what you're supposed to be doing. You were learning, I'm sure we will get to, you were learning on the job, as it were, then. Yes. Yes, I was, and and I I I had the dream of becoming a retailer, like a, a regular grocery. That was my first ambition in life. Was I was that was around the same time, twenty six years old, and I just thought maybe I should have some education in order to become a a guy who knew something about having your own shop. And at that point, I have had jobs where. I was taking care of uh, 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 other shops for people because I, I had a part-time job there. And, and the, the owner of the shop, which is one of my best friends today, uh, he, he was going to Spain with his family for three months. And he asked me whether I could take care of his shop within that three months. And that started me off uh, having the dream that I wanted my own grocery shop and being a retailer. Uh, and I just kind of knew that I needed, I probably needed some education in order to fully understand the uh, that line of business and, and uh, understand the full range of it. Um, and that started me off uh, thinking, okay, I need some more uh, academic uh, information and no knowledge about how to drive a business. So uh, that's interesting, isn't it? So the dream of running your own business came first and then you decided what education you needed in order to fulfill that dream. Yeah. And exactly. that's, it's a much better way of deciding what education you need, isn't it? Rather than people yes. saying, this is what you need, this is what you need. This is, and nobody actually knows what they need when they're growing up. And it's yeah. not until you realize, okay, maybe that's what I should be doing. So now yeah. let me get the education that I need in order to get it done. Um, yep. I, it's it's still shaping my ideas on learning and and I have uh, we'll probably return to it a bit later on my thoughts on on academic learning and organizational learning today but I call it second generation learning mm. uh, uh, approach and I think we are on the very ver urge of or we are beginning a, a journey in learning where that will happen gradually more and more mm. uh, and it requires a, a big shift from us in the learning industry and a lot more of letting go of control control, uh, which I think basically is in the way of, uh, of reaching that, uh, uh, that end goal to yeah. me. Uh, there is a historical part that we, 
that we uh, have to be dealing with and changing. And then there is a control thing we need to be um, be dealing with as well. But maybe we can return a bit later. On yeah, the, yeah, the, please, let's do that. So, and, and I think we do want to get into the meat of that because mm -hmm. if I share with you my experience in, term, in terms of learning, mm -hmm. I, my learn my desire for learning did came very very much later it didn't arrive until i left employment mm -hmm. when i was already you know i w i had already been working 28 years and i mm -hmm. I'd, I'd left employment and when i started doing some personal development only then did i start getting an appetite for learning and oh. now I'm a lifelong learner. You know, I want to learn every day new things. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's really fascinating. So, mm. so okay. Mm. So you started some of the businesses. You started learning some skills, education mm -hmm. to to run your own retail business. So what mm. did you do next? Yeah. What? What? Uh, and what? What I was uh, maybe we didn't. Uh, I didn't emphasize that. But I've been basically also a manager since that age mm. i've been running different projects so management and leadership have been a, a very core part of my uh, my work life since i was a very young person mm. and i've also in that that line developed myself a lot throughout the years learned a lot in in a practical setting but it was first when i started on the educational line that i kind of realized that there was a lot more for me to learn uh, and but it it kept me really interested because it was basically very much a, a part of my work life, no matter what I did. Uh, but that that took me on. Uh, I had my own grocery. I sold it. I, it took me in to become a a, um, a production manager for a, an IT company, uh, where we did in the in the two thousand in the bubble of two thousand. Yes. Uh, I was I was a production manager of a company called Kaisei, which were making uh, images. You, you that was at the time where we started uploading images ordered them online and got a paper version out of uh, the order. That was that was kind of the very early age of that. Yes. Um, and that that took me on to understanding the um, the technology part of, of photography and and online business. Mm. Um, and from there, I took a I was a I was a business developer for a another photo company. I'm, I'm I also have an. Uh, Personal interest in 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 photo. Right. Uh, I've I've had that since I was uh, very young as well. Uh, uh, but but that took me on to uh, to be a business developer, and from there it kind of grew itself. I, I got more and more occupied with the um, with doing uh, more academic work. I did a master's in in organizational development while I was working because that, it really interests me how I, how I could become a manager and a leader uh, in a better sense, and that really opened my eyes. Right. And that took me that took me to the consultant industry uh, and then i was a consultant for some years working with uh, the one of the biggest nordic uh, consultant companies but on a managerial level i worked with the ceo on different organizational change projects where we basically um, Im embedded a a, a structured way to do decisions because we were a widely spread company and uh, the local departments had to be able to do wise decisions. So we had to implement a decision model uh, where you had to advise the nearest seven people in order to do a a, a firm and fall through decision. So you had to you had to uh, include everyone who could be potentially affected by your decision uh, in order to make people being able to do decisions mm. locally. Mm. So, and that was like a really interesting project, and that that led me to um, to some really interesting work. Also, that also started me off in the selling side. I, I had to drive some clients, huge municipalities. Uh, by myself, um, and at that time, I also on the side had a technology company transforming data from uh, one media to another. So I had different lines I did at that time, uh, and then this CEO, which is also still one of my mentors, he um, he stopped at the company. He was uh, exiting uh, the company, uh, even though he started it out. And I knew when he was leaving the company, uh, what he had started out wouldn't be able to survive. And and even though they wanted me to stay, I had to. I knew I had to leave because I I was too much involved in in his project. And and if it failed, they would just look at me, and I would become uh, for several reasons. I, I just thought it was a nice thing to do a move there. Then I moved, started my own consulting company uh, called uh, the Potential House, and then I was only there 
there for uh, half a year, and then I handed it over to uh, one of the employees. And from there, I took or, or my partner, and then I took a, a stake at uh, Relation Technologies, which were uh, one of my friends who, who was a psychologist uh, at that time. He had played been playing around with games in a university setting, and had um, had developed. Uh, kind of the foundation for what we're working on now. He it's kind of he has talked to uh, Rick Mauer about how the cycle of chains works, and he had done a, done a big uh, kind of a physical board on it, uh, and he's kind of taken the first initial steps. And then I onboarded. Uh, I, I got onboarded in 2009, and then I bought half of the company, which were basically nothing. It was only him selling his uh, consultant time. Yes, and I, I at the very beginning could see that this could be a a business that were more than just a consulting business and then the the journey with uh, which is now called acti basically started in 2009 for me uh, and uh, and it just kind of scaled up from there and that was my really uh, that was going from uh, from consultancy and organizational development uh, and change into learning. That was my journey into learning. I I didn't have the notion of learning before that time. Mm. Uh, so 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 I've been I've basically been thinking about learning only for the last eight years, eight nine years. But I haven't been I, I it, it it's been growing from consultancy change leadership organizational development to learning and now it's all about learning for me and we have handed uh, and I, throughout the last 10 years i have known from the very beginning that the the consulting bit were not what was what i was what my passion was about it wasn't the it wasn't it wasn't uh, an idea about becoming a cool consulting helping a lot of companies that has never been my my goal and and not not been my journey or my joy um, my joy has been looking into how we can scale up for more people and learn things in a different way that has always been uh, on my mind okay so 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 the 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 tech the consultancy bit that you did mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. relation technologies correct mm -hmm. yeah so what was it basically around organizational design or what what was that consultancy doing when when uh, we had free we had the basically we had the same uh, uh, a fewer products that we have now but we have we did we did uh, consultancy where we used game as part of the consultancy. Right. So half of the business were doing a consultancy and half of the business were doing tools. But uh, and the tool side were growing and the consultancy kind of stayed at the same level. But we also uh, did uh, develop games for companies. So we we had the Danish payment, the Nordic payment system, uh, wanting a game on values. We created a game on values. Uh, we had uh, companies who wanted um, a, a game on uh, a university who wanted a game on how to collaborate between the academics and the practical people, the administration. Uh, so we did kind of uh, games on it. And then we, at the same time, developed uh, uh, tools for change, tools for leadership and tools for communication. And as more as we went along, uh, they were more getting into shape. And in 2013, I, I kind of started my own journey in thinking, why is it that we design games? Mm. Why isn't that the our clients are designing their own games yes. instead of us designing for them, yeah. uh, and that kind of uh, that that created a situation where me and my we were two partners at that time, and he was the psychology, and we we had to split up for seven reasons at that time, and and I were uh, um, lucky enough to end up with the company which I uh, today I'm really grateful for, but at that time I wasn't. I was very feeling very insecure, but uh, it also open up the opportunity of really uh, start thinking about developing the tool side and 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 uh, keep focusing on on developing tools for learning and uh, and also keep thinking about how can we even more 
create games and tools that are relevant for the context of the use of the tools. Yes. Uh, and that started me out as uh, with uh, we, we've been lucky enough uh, to have huge clients in, in, in the Nordic region. Uh, and also some were on a global scale, huge clients as well. So we were taken in. And at that time, we onboarded Telenor as a client who, who has been a, a huge client for many years. Uh, so all of these huge clients allowed us to uh, play around with tools centered a- around games that you could use in both a uh, workshop setting, but also in everyday work life as a fun and engagement way of keep learning something. Uh, and that's, that's uh, so since 2013, I've been fully focusing on the tool side. And, and, uh, and, and that has been a real pleasure for me because that's, I can, that's, that's basically where my passion is. Um, it's fascinating, isn't it? That, and, and I mean, we know that gaming as mm-hmm. a topic has become huge on the planet, hasn't it, in terms of people has. playing games. And when with the advent of the smartphone, mm-hmm. you know, even older people have started playing games. It's just not the young people but even older people have been using it as a pastime. Mm -hmm. And it's also interesting to know that, you know, when you play a game, you actually learn a lot about yourself um, in terms of what you can't do rather than what you can do. (laughs) And it is a challenge because you want to succeed in that particular game. And there's Mm. this competitiveness inside of us that, you know, well, we're playing a game. Even when we did board games, uh, they still exist, but even when ple- people play board games, they want to win when doing yeah. these board games, you know. So, okay, that sounds really, really fascinating, and it, it certainly sounds like you found the ideal job um, mm. that you're now doing. And it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because whenever we kind of start our own businesses and you've started several, we think that's the thing we're going to be doing for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Um, but then something happens and it changes. Yes. And it's I guess did you did you um have the flexibility to kind of go, okay, I'm now supposed to go into a different direction or how did that come about? Because you've started businesses and then stopped them. But how did that process go? I think I think what what, what you um, what you need to be very dynamically dynamic with as a person is basically what you believe in. Mm. So you have to believe. On one hand, you have to be very truthful to your belief in the success of what you're creating. Like I've been very uh, believing that that what we what I have been part of since 2009 uh, is going to be a success. And it's been a success throughout a lot of years, but that doesn't mean that I've been. It's been necessary to um, to draw in other voices and also move myself or push myself in other directions in terms of what is the right strategy, what is the right uh, approach, and also set your unsecureness uh, out for debate, uh, also amongst your own team. Uh, which is also one, of, I think, one of my strengths, but also one of my weaknesses. Uh, uh, it, but but it's necessary that that you, on one hand, has a very strong belief in the overall business. You you need to believe that this is going to transform. I do. I need to believe that I'm 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 part of uh, uh, of a of an agenda in the world that will change. Mm. Uh, and I I need to I, I need to get my people. Uh, to tap into that dream and that passion and that idea. And you got to be strong in that line. But on the detail side, you got to be very flexible, but also you got to be very cautious about when you know this is not up for a debate because this is influencing the overall strategy. And if a, de- if a detail can influence what you very strongly believe, you should very strongly be arguing and discussing this point. And, and you, you still need to be open that there might be a detail that needs to move you, but you need to be willing to, to discuss it when you can see the direct uh, link between the detail and the overall strategy of what you're trying, trying to achieve. And the belief has to be in the strategy, in, in, in what it is that you want to achieve or your ambition or your mission or what you want to call it. But that has to be very strong. Mm. And you have to be very communicating about it. 
And you have to be, even though as a small company, even though we have a global outreach, we uh, we are uh, 10 people in Roscoe, we have a developer team in India, uh, and we're still a very small company. But but uh, And you still need to be uh, brave enough to shout out uh, to the world what you believe is going to happen with the things you create. Yes. Uh, uh, and and sometimes it's a it's a matter of being brave and and be uh, be brave enough to tell people around you this is what this is what I believe is going to happen with what we are doing right now. And 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 listening to you and and reading some of the stuff before we we got onto this interview is that that vision of actually making a change in the world, which mm. is what you're talking about, right? So yes. that even as a small company, you can have a massive impact as to what's going to happen in the yes. world of learning in the workplaces. Yes. Because, yes. you know, most of it, and I have seen this because I spent a little bit of time in workplace learning, I most of it is broken. We know it's broken. Yes. You know, and most of it people give lip service to. They need to, they do things because it's required for, um, I forget the word now, but making sure that the rules and regulations and the legal parts are covered. You know, yes. you, people have to do this online course because, yes. you know, so that we're all kind of legally we're covered, you know, whether it's health and safety or yes. Yes. all of these kind of boring things that people don't really want to learn, but they have to learn it. But then yes. everything else in relationship to learning is developed in the same way. You know, it's almost like yes. a blueprint to say, this is the way we've all got to learn. You know, you've yes. got to do this course online. There may be some, you know, classroom stuff happen as well from time to time. Um, okay. So yes. I, th I think we're getting to the stage now to get into the meat of it. So, so tell us then, the company now is called what? And what does it essentially do for people? We we do uh, the company is called Act T uh, and it's spelled with two E's in the end and that name comes because we wanted to do we we wanted to have a name that you could easily remember spell uh, and and find uh, online quite easily because we knew we we have had over hundred thousand people playing our games now and we onboard well over ten thousand per year we're gonna have fifty thousand users online uh, at all times uh, within a couple of years on the platform or sorry on the hop. Uh, so we needed a name that were kind of on one hand talking about what we are doing and we wanted to have people knowing that it's about being active mm. uh, and then it has to be something that is helping you or guiding you or doing something for you and in co coaching you have to coach e so it has to be and we thought act e is kind of an uh, you're doing something someone is helping you yes. on one hand and you can do it interactively with each other so that was that was one of the ideas behind the name of act e and then we have the local of a head with ears on uh, and that's that's been taken from the old uh, old business uh, where we had the legs, which were kind of symbolizing the legs. But but this is symbolizing what we do. We only do things that are in relation uh, to each other. That means between humans. We don't do selling of um, uh, selling of goods. We wouldn't do an advertisement learning game or anything. We wanted to we want to work on the soft skill side of learning. That's our core uh, kind of line of business. We know how we can make you engaged in, in the softer part of learning. That's where we want to be. And then, so ACT is the name of the company. Uh, we, do, uh, we do tools, we call them tools, uh, but we also uh, do uh, um, what we call a hub. And a hub is, is kind of the area where you can enter. And there you have a suite of all the tools that we have. Uh, and then you can customize all the tools on that hub. So let's say uh, uh, a company is having their own hub. They can then transform it on a, on a graphical level. That means suddenly you are entering a, a, a early kit level uh, hub. Uh, it's, it's their logos. It's their things on the hub. And then everything you can see on our hub, you can then make a copy. You can transform the languages, the uh, wordings, the situation. You can transform the games. We have uh, well over 20 games that are generic, and the generic ones are the ones you get a hold of if you just enter our platform. Yes. Uh, 
so on one hand, we provide a suite of tools that you can use. Uh, and then you can take step two, which is you can have your own hub. And there you can design what you think is relevant for your organization. So you could basically make your own games directly on the hub. Uh, but you can also choose to just go in as a player, start a game, start playing, inviting your colleagues in, challenge them on a game. Uh, uh, so, so you don't need to have that step. But oh, companies, our clients, they want their own. They want to control what they have. And I think it's a fair wish. Uh, I don't think it's I think it's fair that you say this is what we can provide you with. And please start developing your own. And then then then. So that's basically what we what we provide and, and do you you know when people so the 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 hub comes with 20 games already preloaded yes um you can go in and make changes to those if you wish to but yes. you then also can create your own ones and yes. does the does the hub show you how to do that how to create your own ones Yes, you, we are. Uh, we are. Uh, we are. Uh, we have developed uh, what we call the uh, um, flows. So it, as soon as you buy the hub, you 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 will be taken into a flow where it says, oh, "Okay, now you need to put in your own logo. You need to do this." So uh, and as soon as you do, uh, you take a copy of the game. You then come into a flow where it says, "Now you take to have to take this into consideration. You have to take this into consideration." And then you end up uh, over uh, on a uh, on a overview image of the game that you are trying to build, and then you can go into each section and change the game as you like it to be changed. So we keep we keep working on the usability side of it in order to allow you to do it. But it's a very simple uh, uh, ten step process to build your own game, basically. Right. Fabulous. And we. We have been doing that in the past, uh, uh, since 2014. We have been doing 10 games per year for our clients. But now clients are able to do it themselves. But what they can also do is that they can actually invite their, their uh, consultants. So uh, in Denmark, uh, we have different, we work on a partner strategy when we go abroad. We have partners in Germany, uh, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Denmark, Sweden, Norway. Um, and those partners can also help their clients in order to build the tools. So it, let's say that a, that a company is working with a local co consulting company. Uh, they could basically say to this consulting company, please, could you go in on our hub and then uh, design the game for us? And that con consultant can say, yes, of course I would. It's not necessary to get hold of us anymore. But what we want to do is uh, we want to display, oh, okay, we do small interventions where you can learn what is it that you need to be uh, 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 occupied with if you want to build games what is it that you need to be occupied with if you want to use the tool where you map in your own changes or when you do the style trade exercise so we keep developing helping guides for the consultants and in in our uh, world consultants can both be internal and external but it's all up to the hub owner to decide who they want to work with on their hub yeah it's it's not the consultants who control it it's not us. It's the hub owner. And do you uh, do you provide training? So can, let's say, an organization who subscribes to your platform, mm -hmm. he they've got an internal person who's involved in learning, and they mm -hmm. want to learn how to create that. Do so. They they want to become the internal consultant effectively to create the games. Yes. So do you then train them how to create these? Yeah. Uh, no, we don't. Our partners do. Your partners so, do. Okay, got yeah, you. Yeah, we we have certification programs that runs. Uh, if you go to the homepage and you hit courses, you can see how many uh, partners of ours who's running certifications, and they do that for us. And the reason why we have done that is because we want we don't want to be consultants. Because as soon as we become consultants, we are being interested in selling our time, mm. and selling your time requires that you consult. But yeah. we want to be free in terms of the consultant side. So we have no kickbacks. We have no uh, no other prices uh, than you see on the homepage because we want to be able to basically advise all of our clients, consultant as end clients, on how to use our tools. But if you want to learn more as a, as a company, you can do a certification. You can either do that internally. That basically means you call one of our partner consultants and ask them to come and do an internal certification. Right. Or you can join an external open courses or open enrollment con consulting uh, courses that are run on our script books because they are only allowed to run those if we grant them access to it. Mm. 
but 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 that's like that's that's like the highest level of the uh, of of a partner we have. They are able to run certifications that we have designed in the way that we think is 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 good to run it, and that can be run internally or externally. Yes. And then we do, and then we do a whole lot of uh, other stuff that are not co- that doesn't cost anything, but are basically introduction to the multiplayer. We have a multiplayer uh, in the game where where you and I are, are playing against each other, and I can see what you choose, and you can see what I choose, and so on. Uh, we have we call it uh, we multiplayer Mondays. Uh, we have an introduction to the game builder. Um, that runs uh, every month, uh, where you can just join off for a free course and and be activated in in or start out your own game. So, um, and um, is all of all of this done online? Mm? Is all of the train all the game playing done online? All of the gameplay are done online, but we have tools because we come out of the uh, consultant environment. We still have a lot of tools that you can use in the physical material, but we have built it all online. So all the physical, you could see a, t- a consultant who is having what we call the floorboard, which is a 2.5 meter uh, carbon board on the floor, where you map the results from the online game into a physical world in order to discuss the tools. But that specific workshop um, setting a, a tool is also transformed to the online version because we have what we call the session view, which is basically if you have a session, you create a session uh, equivalent to have a workshop where you say, I have 20 participants in my setting. They are supposed to be in five groups. You then add the groups in. You can even rename them, call them Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, or uh, Germany, w- whatever. You can rename them. You can add people into the specific groups. You can also allow them to add themselves into the group um, in, in the actual workshop. But then you can see all of their movements as they go along in the game or any of the tools. You can see that uh, on the projector. So the consultant who has created the session can see all of the movement of the people who is playing in their session. Yes. So, so that means that you, you don't need any physical material. Everything is being built on an online basic. But you can have a wish that you want to do something in a workshop setting that sure. you think is more beneficial and then you can do that and we also provide tools for that but we have built it all so you can do everything online also uh, the exercises as a consultant um, brilliant and can you do this is it just on a desktop or is it a mobile phone or a smartphone you can do it on all devices uh, no matter what device you want to use you can do it uh, there, there are no limits the only limits that we have been uh, we haven't been able to meet is a, is a stupid one but it's basically because microsoft has stopped updating the explorer version of their browser yes and 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 if we wanted to have a game run on explorer which is now very old uh, technology yes. we had to we had to scale down on technology yeah. Uh, and which we, we just had, we just took the decision that we we didn't want to do a bad game in order to meet the requirements no, of Microsoft. No, so, no. But that's about it. Yeah, that's the only thing. <clears throat> okay, so now, so now my question: so that's the kind of the technology side of how it all mm-hmm. works and how people can work it with the consultants and everything. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> so, what, in your view, then, Leif, do you believe? the benefit and what are some of the benefits that you're seeing with clients of using your kind of gamification technology? I think there are, uh, uh, from my point of view and uh, from my company's point of view, there are basically uh, two two or three major uh, advantages of using our tools. One is that we, we have a focus on engagement at the workplace. So that means uh, that basically means that whatever you do in the workshop setting can be taken with you back to work and you can drive. Like, let's say you learn something from John Cotter about changes, which is one of the one of the theories most used. You, you, you learn something about John Cotter, you play around with John Cotter in a game setting where it's become fun or Rick Mauer, and it, it's a fun way of learning. Then you can take the exactly same graphical uh, expression of a theory and then you can map your own context into it. So that's going from a game to a practical tool where you can basically run your own changes into the tool. You can share that with your colleagues. You can share that with someone who's who who from who it's relevant to follow your change. So it could be your manager, it could be your project leader, and then you can revisit that the situation, update the image, or you can add on the theory that you have learned about. So you can revisit re in. Um, 
uh, reinforce what you have learned about the theories and add that on. You can even add your own theories into it. So it's going from a game to become a practical tool that helps you in your everyday work life. We have the same on leadership, but that's basically the, one of the biggest advantages of it. The second uh, thing I, 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 I'm really proud about is that we have been collecting data since 2010. So we have millions of, uh, of different theory uh, solutions to specific issues and we can even benchmark companies against companies we can benchmark games against games and so so that that means that the company if you create a session where you have 20 people in the room you will as a company be able to see how does these people solve issues in a game and you can measure that against other groups of people in the company who's played the same game and you can even measure that against data that is more than uh, five years old. So you can see, are they, are they, are we basically able to teach these people anything? And does it have an influence on the way that they solve issues in the games? Because if it changes things for people, they should be able to look for different solutions in the game also, because we're trying to teach them to find the optimal theoretic solution to a specific issue they're trying to solve. Mm. And if they are able to do that, they should be able to do the right choices. And you, in our game, you win the game by adding the right theory to the right situation at the right time. Mm. And that's what we're trying to teach people. And once you have played around with that, you, you are able to take that into your own context and build upon the same idea. But we display and hit and, and give the data back to the organizations, allowing them to get some, some, really, some real statistics on where should we support our people. Yeah. On soft skills. Yeah. So so it's it's basically trying to add value back to the strategic level of the organization. So instead of thinking, oh, we should give them some change uh, uh, theory, they could basically say we could see that the the plant section in uh, in Ukraine needs some support in terms of working on resistance on maybe the emotional level because they never choose that. They never work with that. They don't recognize it as a problem. Yes. And we know for a fact it's a problem because we can see that everywhere else. So why shouldn't it be a problem over there? Or maybe we should examine whether it's a problem or not a problem, at least. Yeah. And then we should make some conscious decisions on how, sh- how could we support these guys on, uh, from a learning strategic level. And that's, that's, the, that's the benefit. And that's also the benefit for the player and the user of the tool on a personal level. Because... I, as a person who plays or uses our tools, can measure myself against my company. So, and that's that's uh, that's really a an engagement uh, uh, trigger for everyone because I can see my leadership profiles, I can see my uh, my scores, I can see my data collection. How have I solved different issues on a theory perspective? Because you can see I've I've chosen twenty five percent resistant levels, but everyone else is choosing twenty percent. So I, I have a 5% different profile that my colleagues, that's strange and fun. Maybe I should try and develop that. So that means that I can go in, I can try and develop my own profile for the fun. Because what we like as learners is looking at ourselves and measure ourselves against our colleagues. Mm. So that's, and, that's, that's the engagement thing uh, yes. that you get. And do I, I mean, is that kind of public then, that information, or is it private to me? The, 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 uh, we our confidential uh, confidentiality in terms of data is a company can see groups they cannot see persons right we so so the, your data is yours you c- that won't be displayed to anyone and you can if you delete your email on the platform or sorry on the hub uh, if you delete your email on the hub it's not connected to you anymore we don't combine our data with Facebook or anything else. Uh, so there are no, we don't import data for any third parties. We only keep our own data and we don't sell that data to anyone else. Mm. So you won't be able to be messaged. So as soon as you, you delete your email, the connection to you is gone. So yeah. if you don't want the data, you can just delete your email. Yeah. Wow. And and is this this facility to be able to do this, is this something that is, you know, publicly available or is it only through going through via consultants or talking to you directly in terms of people wanting to sign up and use your services? How does how do people kind of get in touch with you and go, right, I want to investigate this and look at this? 
they just basically go to the homepage, hit the, the hit the demo session or subscription session, and log in and start playing. You know, there are no need for getting hold of us or any other consultants at all, unless you want to know more. Unless you want to, you can even buy a hub directly on the homepage without having us there. Oh, okay, cool. So everything everything is is done online, uh, and but there is a chat box where if you wanted to ask some questions, you just hit the chat box and someone will answer you. So so everything is meant to be done directly by you as a user or being done by your company. Uh, uh, and then there are different kind of subscription plans uh, that you can choose. But but if you wanted to play around, it's uh, just hit acti.com uh, and subscribe and go in and play. Right. So and 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 uh, the next. The next add-on that we do is is a challenge plan where I can challenge you directly without being on a hub. So that basically means I could challenge uh, anyone directly on the hub. Uh, send an invite, and we will be playing against each other in the same game. That's the next step that we're taking because we we think, uh, and that come, brings me back to the control thing. We have had a lot of discussions uh, in the office related to control. Control, because we have a mindset that we should be controlling what people can see, do, and uh, with our tools. And, and I'm just so I, I just have the totally opposite idea. Mm. Why? Why should we control? Why shouldn't you be allowed to invite and challenge whoever you think is relevant for you to challenge? Mm. Why shouldn't you, as a user, be able to do whatever you think is great on the platform? Yes. Why should we ever restrict that? I mean, what is dangerous? about learning. Why can it ever be uh, dangerous if you wanted to look at a totally third theory uh, that you were looking at before? I mean, uh, by not stopping your curiosity, but really letting you be uh, curious about what you can explore and uh, extract and find the boundaries in what we have in there, the better it is. The more you are occupied with it, the better it is for you. So I, I, um, I'm going to throw an idea at you. Mm -hmm. Great. And so f let, let me paint a scenario. Mm -hmm. um, I do some volunteering for a UK homeless charity called Crisis. Mm -hmm. And let's say, uh, well, we do, we already teach and train homeless mm -hmm. people how mm -hmm. they can get back into society. You mm -hmm. know, we train mm -hmm. and help them how to get um, employment, we train and help them how to find their new home. Um, we support them in the journey. We support them in, you know, socializing again with people because they've been out of society. They've been living on the street or they've been mm -hmm. rough sleeping or they've been sofa surfing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So let's say I wanted to create a game where they can, and this is not necessarily about change management or leadership, you know, this is about designing my own game, creating my mm -hmm. own game, where mm -hmm. they now are going to learn and solve, they themselves are going to have to solve their problem of homelessness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we give them a game and say, okay, you now need to go on this journey, on this, go inside the game and identify yourself as to where you're at and then we're going to give you certain scenarios where you are going to have to solve your own homelessness situation yeah great i can do that yeah yes you can you can you can on top of the uh, you can do on top of each of the platform we have which is a leadership communicate one is for leadership one is for communication one is for change you can take a copy of each of the game and there's different you have to imagine that there are different graphic designs and then you could take a copy and you can add in your own choices your own descriptions your own people uh, and you can even add in a new theory so you could say okay we we have different ways that you could solve this specific issue and those uh, those choices or those opportunities they come from this uh, model of thinking or you can add that in and you could collect data and you could say this is how people uh, are trying to solve this issue this is what we can see they choose they never choose this one over here they never choose to uh, being in a, being uh, living in a in a home for homeless people they always choose to live under the bridge in in their own carbon boxes mm. why is that uh, uh, or you you could you could map you can map in and you you get data on how they solve issues 
on a strategic level. Yes, so you can do that directly. It's just, and, and just giving me an idea, definitely. To There's a lot going on at the moment to solve homelessness in the UK and to end homelessness forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and the company that I volunteer for, that's what they're looking to do. And this will be incredible to be able to, you know, have them themselves go in the game and try and solve their own problem. But getting the data on how they go about it will be just awesome. Yeah. 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 And you can even, you can even, this, it doesn't have to be like a secret data. You can just open it up to everyone and say everyone can have a look at it. Yeah. And you can even, you can even decide. Who do you want to be able to build games? You might have homeless people who actually have a better idea about what type of game you should build. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I agree. So, so, so you could you could even say if you wanted to build your own game on our hub, uh, feel free to contact me, and I'll let you in. Uh, uh, because the hub owner can choose who should be able to work on the platform. Sure. Or sorry, on the hub. Sure. So. Got you. Okay, well, yeah. that's definitely it's got my mind racing off in all sorts of directions. <laughs> great. Ah, great. Oh my god, it's it mm. sounds incredible and mm. I bet what kind of feedback are you getting from people, you know, how are they enjoying it? Yeah, I I I think the journey there has to be a little bit of a historical journey explanation here because I onboarded investors in 2016 in the beginning of the year. Yes. Uh no sorry, in 2017. Uh, there I onboarded some strong investors who knew all about online uh, onboarding people to an online product, SaaS, which is called a SaaS business, yes. which basically means software as a service. Uh, and these the, these guys has been there since then and then we started a development project of basically rebuilding what we have already which were a second generation yes. uh, into a third generation so the third generation has been live since the first of january and we've just been on uh, locking on the game builder uh, uh, and the data section onto the uh, to the um, to the hub for uh, two weeks ago but we have been onboarding clients uh, onto both those uh, but just secretly uh, before that and we are getting great feedback on it i, I had a call from uh, a company called bestseller on the phone on friday and uh, this guy calls me up and he says um you know what life uh, i am um uh, you know i'm from jordan which is the, the kind of the outskirts of denmark it's, uh, and and they have a they have a very uh, silenced way of uh, talking about emotions so he said uh, do you want it in a jordan way or do you want it straightforward <laughs> he had something that he wanted to say to me yeah. and i i was kind of thinking oh god uh, oh yes. w w when one from the countryside is kind of putting words in that way it's a it's getting it's getting hard this conversation Bad news. and then i said oh you know what well, we've been collaborating for and, and bestseller is one of the biggest retailers in the world so they're quite important to us mm. uh, and he said oh, do, you, do you want my straight feedback or do you want it to judge on way and i said I, you know what well, we've been together for many years shouldn't we just um uh, talk to each other straightforward so just give it up and then he said, uh, you know what? We just think what you have done is really, really brilliant. <laughs> and I was, I, I had to stop my car. I, I was, I was <laughs> kind of, you know, we've been there for five months now. Uh, and this is the type of the feedback we get. Uh, people are just liking the idea that they can control what is there. Yeah. They can control what they want to display. Uh, and I think the idea of uh, being what we do second order design is uh, flipping it around, allowing you to design. It's just great. It's just the right thing to do. I can I could definitely see that. Uh, of of course, it's so new that we have a, we experience also a usability box where we can see oh okay so they have to press one more time here and that's of course not the right way. We have to change that. So so of course we are also learning uh, that things should be in a different way. But the general overall image is this is super it's a, it's perfect for the user it's perfect for the companies uh, the consultants are it's very easy for those guys because they can add it in quite easily into their service towards their clients uh, and the data section is just brilliant because it gives you an idea about what what is it that we're trying to do here yes. so that's the feedback we're getting and wow. we are, i don't consider it as finished we're not finished of course not. Uh, no no yeah <laughs> you yeah. you never arrive, right? <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. So, exactly. oh, it sounds really, really brilliant. What about the UK? We have um, we have um, we have one 
partner that we're really, really fond of that we've been working with, with a lot, for a lot of uh, years, uh, who's also working with the Center for Creative Leadership and who is working with CLP, who's working with different different consultant companies as a consultant. And he's our, kind of our anchorman. But to be honest, we, we don't have a structured uh, uh, kind of a approach uh, or set up in the UK yet. Mm. And we're, we're trying to achieve that. Uh, um, and that is uh, definitely on the uh, radar for uh, the end of this year or the start of next year. We have uh, we have uh, Germany and, and the UK as kind of our main focus areas. Uh, and we don't really, I think it's basic because we haven't spent time over there. That's why we don't have the setup. We have the setup in the Nordic, uh, Germany, Holland and, um, and Belgium, but we don't in the UK. But well, we, we know we should do something. Sure. Well, hopefully this podcast you know, somebody will hear it and great. they'll be interested in getting in touch with you. <laughs> oh, that would be great. That would be fantastic if that's possible. Oh, yeah. okay. So, life, is, is there anything we've missed? Anything that we haven't covered that you think we still need to cover? <laughs> I, I think I think what we haven't covered is uh, is uh, my learning ideas, but I do I do uh, some speeches on learning conferences. Uh, uh, I have one in 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 Belgium in the autumn that I think people should uh, attend and have a look at because I, I have some ideas on how we should transform learning. But I think it's it, it, we've been talking now for a little uh, a long time now, so I think that should maybe we should. There is uh, there is no way we can let people go without hearing your views on learning. Okay. I think okay. that this is vital. If you've got the time, um, just just give us a few nuggets because I think this is vitally important because you're creating all of this in the background and it's yes. based on your belief and it's based on your vision and, and your view of learning. So I think we have to share it with them. Okay, great. Okay, uh, okay, good, uh, good. Uh, let me. Uh, th the first thing I think is a, is a, um, uh, in terms of learning, there is a there is a need for complexity reduction. So that goes all the way down to usability. Uh, but, but there is a reduction in the complexity of what people can grasp and learn online, and that's a that's a natural frame around uh, what we can add into a tool and what also other people can add into our design. But we're trying to think about that. We're trying to try and build tools that you can use more rapid. So it doesn't have to be a four-hour process. It has to be a 10-minute process maybe. So that's one of, the, one of my ideas is that we need to make smaller interventions that can't be played in everyday work life that we can challenge each other in a more rapid way. So learning interventions is not workshop settings. It's more small things you can do again and again and again. And you can find them funny and still get a learning out of it. And learning to me is learning something about something else. It's not only, and that something else has to be transformed into value for the company. If it doesn't have the transformation, which is in the learning theory, it's called transfer. If it doesn't have that aspect, it's not valuable to me um, because it has to be something you can basically do something with. Uh, um, that's And that maybe leaves me to the next uh, kind of focus area I have in learning, which is learning has to be um, has to be learning environment have to change from something learning and development and HR creates for people out in the organization to something where people in the organization are designing learning interventions and learning processes for other people in the same situation as they are. So let's try and scale that down. I'm in a factory setting. Uh, I, I'm looking at a machine that is broken down. I need to be rapidly understanding vital information about this machine or vital information as a manager on how to task uh, this specific issue that I'm meeting in front of me right now. I might not do it instantly in this moment, but when I'm back at the PC, I need to be able to drag some information down that I can find interesting and maybe challenge someone else to make it more engaging in order to learn something to solve that issue I've been a part of. And that's flipping it around from uh, HR saying we need the organization to learn something about uh, change to say when they feel a need to learn something about change, they need to be able to do something with change in a, a smaller time period, faster, and they maybe need to build their own design in terms of what do I specifically need to learn about change. Mm -hmm. Maybe I only need to know uh, about resistance levels. Why should I then spend two days in a course 
learning about change management mm. if I only got to use 10% of it. Mm. So that's flipping around to what I call second generation learning. We need to provide tools that are user, uh, usability friendly enough to allow users to design on them and allow users to create uh, praxis uh, uh, spaces where they can share um, with each other who's in the same situation as we are, maybe internally in the company, but also uh, with people from external uh, outside of the company. And and that's that's a loose of control for HR and learning developers. Yeah, because everybody is used to what is also classed, and I'm sure you've come across this term, which is the sheep dip approach, which is everybody has to conform, and therefore we're all going to... Yes you know, yes. dip them in the same liquid. So, yes. so you're right, you're going to learn about change management. You're going to learn about leadership. You're going to talk about people management. You're going to, you know, you're going to learn about all of these different modules. We're going to put you on a training course and these are the things we're going to give you. Or you're going to do an online course and that's what you've got to learn. And at the end of it, we're going to measure whether you've done it, uh, what your score mm. is, uh, whether you need to do it again. Uh, you know, yeah, that, yes. that's the model that people run by pretty much. Yes. And I, I think I think it's the there is a historical barrier that has created that uh, what you what you call uh, did you call it deep sheep? Sheep, uh, sheep dip, sheep she dip. Yeah, sheep deep learning. Yes. Uh, I, I, I think uh, that, that, that comes out of the historical uh, approach to learn because we have been we have been historically designing a societies in the Western world uh, uh, where you go to a university, you go to school, you go to university, and that's where you learn something. Mm. And university is university. They, they, they have a certain approach and they have developed a certain method uh, on how to learn. But it, but it doesn't, uh, and that's in the way of basically uh, doing the transformation on learning, c going away from that, uh, and also being able to uh, uh, trust uh, that people who has a need for learning will figure out how to get that learning and maybe let them decide what others could uh, kind of tap into. Mm. Because it, it, it's a little bit like the manager's uh, uh, role. If you don't have that role in the organization, if you don't have learning, who's taken that into consideration, what is smart for everyone else to learn, they don't have a role to play. But I think that's wrong. They have a role to play. Their role is to create uh, hybrid uh, technologies, uh, workshop settings and making sure that what they provide to people are able to be transformed into valuable uh, uh, initiatives in everyday work life. That's that's basically their, their key role. That that's the core of their why they're there, and they need to they need to secure that. Yes. And not securing not securing uh, like the the first level, which is what people are supposed to meet when they want to learn something, because it's basically a lost uh, battle. Today, if you if you Google, uh, I, I advise everyone to Google what is the most learning uh, technologies today, and there will be like a hundred lists. And on top of all the hundred lists are Google, YouTube, uh, Excel. So it's not even it's not the LMS, it's not the uh, the hops, it's not it's not anything else. It's basically where there are no control. That's where people learn from. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so they lost the control already. Yes. Uh, but, but it's a matter of losing the control in a way where they think we we know that we need to be able to provide first class technologies that gives people the opportunity to influence mm. what it is that they want to learn and and influence when and how they want to learn it. Yeah. Uh, and that also goes. But can, can you imagine a workshop where where the facilitator comes unprepared? Uh, it, it, it's it's basically mind blowing, isn't it? I mean, they pay uh, uh, three thousand euros for a day, and then someone is not prepared. But maybe that person should be prepared in the sense of how do you think you could actually get that learning in? Mm. What would be beneficial for you guys? How, are there any groups in this room who can spend time together and then figure that problem out? I, I mean, there are thousands of ways, but and we have to be brave. But we don't dare to be brave because we're brought up in a historical environment where the way that you learn is that you sit down in a school setting, you have someone in front of you who's kind of organizing it all. Absolutely. It, <laughs> and yeah, I totally agree. hundred percent agree. And yeah. it's, it's about, they are transmitting to the audience or the student, you know, they're just transmitting information and that's 
how we think people learn, which of course we know they do not. And it's yes. not until they can relate to they can relate it to a real life situation, a real situation that they are in and experiencing and how they need to solve it. So once mm. you get into the space of solving problems, getting into a game, and it's pretending you're solving something, you are starting to access the yes. neurons in your brain for problem solving. And yes. you can then transfer that learning, that approach, that methodology to what you're really experiencing in the workplace. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I totally get it. I love it. I mean, gamification has been talked about for years. I don't know how many people are truly doing it properly out there, but it certainly sounds that you with Acti are moving into a space that it is absolutely brilliant. So well done to you. Thank you. Thank you. And and please remember, games is only a part of our our, our approach. It's it's basically a tool. Yes. Yeah. Got it. That's yeah important to understand. Also, even though we are, we are top notch of the ones who does it, we we still consider it as a tool. Mm. It has to be considered as a tool. It's not enough to have only games. No. No, um, it's a tool because you're looking. You have to transfer the learning. Yeah. Back into the workplace. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant life. Well, I, I really appreciate that last bit and you sharing some of your thoughts because I think it's vitally important. And if people want to get in touch with you, um, please share. I'll put it in the show notes as well, but please share where they can find you and connect with you and get in touch. They, they can find me on, on all social platforms. My name is uh, L-E-I-F Sørensen, S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N. -E so I, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on uh, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we are on YouTube as Acti. Uh, and and um, uh, they can find me. Uh, they can also find, of course, everything about me on the homepage. Just go to Acti, A-C-T-E-E dot -E com. Uh, hit the contact page and there's a lot of um, all, all of our employees are there and I'm there and they can just directly hit the subscription and have a look at the tools and any questions at all uh, we are a very open-minded uh, company so basically just get in touch uh, I might not be able to answer uh, but but there are people in the office who every day so so just be in contact we we love to hear from people so, brilliant brilliant yeah well Hopefully, you'll get some business in the UK and yeah. make me one promise. If you do come to the UK, London or wherever, let me know and I'll make sure to, to meet up with you and we can have some lunch and um, have, find out how things are going and keep up to date with each other. I will. Thank you. It will be a pleasure. Uh, I will. I, I'm in London quite often, so I will give you a call and let's have lunch for sure. Okay, live. Well, thanks Thank for so coming much. and Thank hope you. to meet you soon in person. Take care. Sure. Take care. Bye. Bye for now. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 